opportunity to share a little bit about my story. My name is Lisa Brackbill. I currently Hello. live in Hershey, Pennsylvania, but I'm from Northern California and proud of that. I have been married to my husband, Brennan, for almost 11 years. Um, I have a political science degree and lobbying experience prior to motherhood, which will come into play later. I am a mother of three, including identical twin boys who are three and a half. I am an author, and I'm also an advocate for newborn screening for Crab A lipodystrophy since 2015. I became an advocate because of this wonderful little girl who was born on July 30th, 2014 in Harrisburg. Everything was fine. We thought that she was perfectly healthy and we didn't think we had anything to worry about. This picture was taken on January 6, 2015, and we had no idea that the next day our day our life was about to change. She became symptomatic with Crebe on January 7th, and that's a very distinct day in my memory because it was as though a switch had flipped and she became a completely different baby. She was incredibly irritable. She was throwing up everything that she ate, meaning that she also was not gaining weight. Um, I'll go through the steps in a little bit, but she was eventually diagnosed with Crebe on Friday, February 13th, 2015. She died from Crebe at 20 months of age on March 27th, 2016. And that's all because she was not screened for Crebe at birth. So here's a quick timeline. We are actually very fortunate that in our diagnostic journey, we didn't have to wait months and months because of the high class medical system we have here in Hershey, it actually was pretty quick. So symptoms began on January 7th. January 14th, I took her to the pediatrician because I just knew that something was wrong. And the pediatrician thought it was reflux, which is actually the most common misdiagnosis of Crebe. When the medicine didn't work on January 30th, the uh, pediatrician came up with another theory about hydrocephalus, which took us to the ER to get a CAT scan. That CAT scan revealed brain abnormalities. February 4th, she had an MRI and that in and of itself was a miracle because they weren't gonna be able to schedule her for an MRI until May, which now we know would have been devastating. So on February 6th, she received a leukodystrophy diagnosis and she was admitted to the hospital for a feeding tube because she was labeled as failure to thrive. February 12th, we were released from the hospital with an NG tube and said we would get the results from the blood work in two weeks. But the next day is when I got a phone call and I knew that something must be either really good or really, really wrong. And sure enough, it was not a good day. The neurologist came in and she was in her plain clothes. She was not supposed to be at work that day. And she told us that our daughter had Crebe and that she would probably not live to be two, which turned out to be true. In that same appointment, she told us that we should probably not have any more children naturally because of the likelihood of another child having it. Through the wonders of social media, we were connected to the Crabbe community very quickly because I had been blogging about it, about the word spread. And so we were put in contact with Dr. Maria Escalar from the Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, and she arranged for us to come just a few days later. So I have some pictures to show how you can actually see Crab A appear in her. This was one week beforehand. It was obviously Christmas, um, big bright eyes. You can see, even though she's not necessarily smiling in this picture, you can see that her facial muscles are working. Um, the picture on the left, everybody thought she was laughing, but in reality she was crying. And now we know she was in extreme pain, um, but Brennan, my husband was trying to get her to calm down. And then that picture is the day we had the CAT scan. This is before we found out that they saw brain abnormalities. So in these pictures, you can see Crab A. You can see that her eyes are not as wide in all the pictures, but mostly in her face. Like I never noticed this until maybe two or three years ago, looking back. And you can see that she was unable to smile. And indeed, she never smiled ever again after January 6, 2015. So briefly, what is Crab A? I don't want to assume that you know what it is. Um, Crab A is a form of leukodystrophy that requires treatment in the first month of life. Babies with Crab A lack an enzyme called galactocerebrosidase, which I'm proud that I can pronounce, <laughs> which means that their cycosine levels are elevated. Cycosine is a toxin that harms the myelin in the brain and nervous system. 
The most common form is early infantile, which presents in the first few months of life, which is what she had. The life expectancy is age two. It affects about one in 100,000 people, but we believe that as it is screened for in more states, it's going to have a, we'll have a more accurate number. Approximately one in 125 are carriers. Um, I'm from California, as I mentioned before, and my husband is from central Pennsylvania, and we both have the same mutation. So we kind of joke that we are meant to be. Currently, 10 states include Crabbe on the newborn screening panels. When Tori was diagnosed, that was only two. So there has been great progress, uh, but we still have a long way to go. Most excitingly, gene therapy clinical trials are underway in Pennsylvania, both in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. So we're very fortunate that anybody that screens positive for Crab A here will have an opportunity to enroll. So a brief look at what it took to care for Tori. In this picture alone, you can see a gray bag that has the cough assist machine. You can see her suction machine, which always had to be nearby. Um, you could see the nasal cannula because she was on oxygen at this point. Um, she had to have a G-tube put in in May of 2015. And at the same time, we also had the Nissen procedure done, which allowed or kept her from throwing up. She had speech, vision, physical, and occupational therapy in our home through early intervention. She lost the ability to swallow in June of 2015, which was terrifying because, of course, it was on a Friday afternoon. She went on oxygen in November 2015. She was on three medications. There were a few other ones thrown in there at different times. She was fed by two, five times daily. She, like I said, we had a cough assist, we had a nebulizer, we had a shaky vest, we had an adaptive stroller, we had a stander. We also had to buy a minivan to be able to transport her because her equipment would not fit in our car. But despite all of this, we, about a month into our new reality, we decided that we were not going to live whatever time we had with her in grief and sorrow, we decided that we were going to choose joy. We were going to give her the best possible life that she could have. So we created a bucket list. This is too many things for you to read. I know. Um, I just wanted to show you the 50 things that we did with her. And then I'll show you some pictures. Um, some of these were added to the list because we wanted to give her a, a normal childhood. So we did a few things that were quote normal like seeing fireflies jumping in mud puddles things like that but then we also did some things that were extraordinary that we may not have been able to do had she not been sick so she got to feed giraffes twice actually she got to go to disney world thanks to a leuco another foundation by a leukodystrophy family that sends infants on wish trips because tori did not qualify for make a wish because of her age we took her to the Grand Canyon. We took her um, so many different places. And in the right-hand corner, you can see that I had a photo session of her in my wedding dress that was a surprise for Brennan because we knew she would never get the opportunity to wear it someday. Here you can see us kayaking on the Susquehanna River. And then these two are from New York City. So she passed away on March 27th, 2016, and we had her celebration of life on April 9th. These are just a few pictures from that. You can see all the giraffes. Giraffes became her mascot because she always had this one particular giraffe that we named Victor with her because it lit up and she loved the light and it played music. She didn't care as much about the music, but the light she wanted to have on all the time. So that's how we also knew she could still see. Um, you can see the ribbons with her faces or with her, her faces, with her pictures on it. Um, we actually had one of her Facebook followers make those and ship them from New Mexico, which was so kind. These are the bookmarks we gave out. And then you can see cheese balls and dum-dums. And that's because those are two of the things we allowed her to taste, even though she was not allowed to eat or swallow anything. We did want to give her tastes of things and that was allowed. So we gave those out as I hate to call them favors, but that's kind of what it was because this was a party. So then there's a picture of her grave marker, the handmade, we call it the box because the word coffin is just terrible. Uh, she was honored at a Hershey Bears game at the Giant Center the weekend after she passed away because of our involvement with Hershey and with the Bears. I'm one of their national anthem singers. And then that is actually the last picture I took of her while she was alive. She actually died twice that day. Um, and the first time I wasn't there and 
thankfully she came back um, and we got to all be with her when she passed away. So I had blogged throughout our journey at the Brackbills.com because that is how I processed everything. It helped me also communicate information because as you can imagine, this journey created a lot of anxiety within me, not like the disorder, but just everybody wanting everything from me all the time, everybody reaching out to find out what was going on. And so I started for Facebook page, which now still has over 14,000 followers. And I started blogging everything just so I could have a place to, like I said, to process, but also spread information. So I was approached by a book editor and encouraged to write a book. So I did, and it came out a month before the twins were born. <laughs> Not the best timing. Um, and it chronicles our journey and how we chose joy despite the circumstances. And I, I wrote it also to create awareness about Crabbe because most people have never heard of it. I wrote this out in case I get emotional um, because here I am. <laughs> but words cannot express how much I wish this weren't my story. But I cannot deny that it was always supposed to be mine. There's no doubt that I was prepared for this journey long ago in more ways than I can count. I would do anything to have Tori with me today as a healthy seven-year-old girl. But since I cannot change that, I'm going to keep working to give other parents that gift. No parent should have to bury their child and no parent should find out that this could have been prevented by a simple test at birth. And so I fight and will continue to do so until every baby in the US is screened for Crabbe and other leukodystrophies at birth because I can't imagine living any other way. So as a brief background to show you why I think this was always supposed to be my job, I actually first technically lobbied when I was in kindergarten. Uh, it was 1988, I believe, 87, 88. And um, George H.W. Bush was running against Dukakis, Michael Dukakis. And I we had a little classroom election. I did not know anything about politics back then, but I used my reasoning to tell the class that we should all vote for Bush because we could spell his name. Um, so that unknowingly kind of launched me into political awareness. I, I remember so many elections from when I was young. Um, after I graduated from high school, I did a lobbying internship in Sacramento. And I was able, as you can see in this picture, to actually help lobby a bill. I believe the bill was about allowing students to have to carry their own ibuprofen and things like that with them instead of having to go to the nurse's office. Um, so then in college, I studied political science and history. I spent a semester in Washington, DC, where I also got some more advocacy experience. I moved to Pennsylvania in July of 2008, and I chose Harrisburg because it's the capital. I got a job at a lobbying firm in fall of 2008. I left that job and politics altogether in fall of 2009. I never, ever wanted to do anything political again. But then Tori was diagnosed with Crabbe in February 2015, and I couldn't deny that this is what I was supposed to do, but this time as a mother. This is actually 10 days before Tori died, so she did get to participate with me in some advocacy. This was Rare Disease Day in the Capitol, and you can see her in the middle of the group picture there. Um, and you could see her having people shake, senators shake hands over her. But she was able to come with me on a couple of little lobbying adventures. But this is before we even had really launched any of our legislative efforts. So three weeks after Tori died, I attended my first Pennsylvania Newborn Screening Technical Advisory Board meeting. And my dad took this picture. He was there with me. I will never forget that meeting because Crabbe was actually the first thing on the agenda. So back then there was actually a law in place for it to be on the screening, but it hadn't been implemented. And I will never forget the chair of the committee at the time talking about what a waste of time it would be. And the whole reason it was on there was because he announced that Hershey Medical Center had started screening for Crabbe. And until our law went into effect this May, they were the only hospital screening for Crabbe. Anyway, I will never forget the anger and frustration I felt because I just didn't understand. But I have attended every meeting since then. I have learned so much and now I completely understand why they didn't want to screen for it. And thankfully, I was able to show through journal articles and my persistence that it is indeed worthy of screening. 
But it was also at these meetings that I learned that we had more problems in Pennsylvania than just not screening for Crab A. I learned that we had major inequality issues. So as a background, there were previously two different panels of newborn screening tests in Pennsylvania, and only 10 conditions were mandatory. 10. We also were about second to last in the nation for the amount of conditions that for which we were screening. But the worst part for me was the screening was not equal from hospital to hospital. They all had to screen for those 10. They did not have to screen for anything on the supplemental panel. And that really bothered me because one of the big phrases within the rare disease community is eradicating death by zip code. If Tori had been born in New York, she would have been screened for Crab A at birth and she would probably be here today. So we're trying to eradicate the zip code issue. Like it shouldn't matter where you were born if there's a chance for you to have a healthy life. So in, in sometime in 2016, I can't remember exactly when, we introduced HB 1081, which died. So in 2019, we introduced HB 730, which they numbered for Tori's birthday. Both of those died for the exact same reasons, and this is not speculation. I was actually told by the Speaker of the House's office that they did not want to give the minority party a win. And that made me really, really angry, like mama bear angry, because they weren't even looking at the bill on its merit. So I played their game, went to my senator, who's in the majority party, and SB 983 was introduced in January 2015. I know this might be hard to see, but you can see it was introduced in January, but then it didn't get to go. I'm sorry, I meant January 15th, 2020, not 2015. So then it didn't get to go to committee until September because COVID hit and all the legislature was doing, rightfully so, was pandemic related things. So I had the fight of my life ahead of me because the session was about to end. The session was actually supposed to end in October, but because they didn't have a budget laid out, they kept adding days. And that gave me time to overcome the hurdles that we had to come up unexpectedly at the last minute, because that's always how it goes, right? And we got it from committee to the governor's desk in less than two months. I was exhausted, but we did it. He signed the law on November 25th, 2020, and it went into effect in May of this year. This on the left is the packet that I created using my son's newborn screening filter paper. Um, the picture, I mean, and I took always pictures of Tori. This is, and then this is me speaking at Newborn Screening Awareness Day, which was in September of 2019, because we didn't get to have one in person the last two years. That is my husband and I giving our senator a copy of our book, and we took him a five pound chocolate bar because of all of his help, and we live and work for Hershey, so we had to do that. And then this is a picture of how SB. 983 became Act 133 of 2020. And so in Pennsylvania, newborn screening is now mandatory and equal, and it includes CREBE. We also improved and strengthened the program by allowing the advisory board to be the ones to add conditions. That's who should be adding it, not legislators. They don't know anything about genetics or these rare diseases. And so we strengthened that, and I'm so very grateful because they do deserve that um, that authority. So what's next for me? I am currently assisting congenital CMV moms with SB 709. So CMV is actually incredibly common. I think they said one in 200 babies is born with it and it can cause hearing loss and all these other things. And so they are they are advocating for after a failed hearing screen to have the babies tested for CCMV. Their bill actually got almost to the finish line last year, the same time mine did, but for the same exact reasons, there's never got to go to the Senate floor. I also have been doing, continuing to do outreach to families newly diagnosed with Crab A. I also want to highlight that since we started screening for Crab A in May of this year, we've already identified at least two children, two babies in Pennsylvania, identical twins with Crab A. So now they are in Dr. Escalar's hands and we are so grateful. But I also was able to help start the Leukodystrophy Newborn Screening Action Network. I have a quick video to show you because it's already, it's really well done and then you don't have to hear me talk about it.
Within the Luka Dystrophy community, many of us feel compelled to try to change the... Whoops, sorry. I was trying to turn the volume up and I paused it. Oh no. Sorry. World ...because our own world has been shattered. But this is often easier said than done. With each state making its own rules and with science moving faster than bureaucracy, it can often seem too complicated to even try. That's why we created the Leukodystrophy Newborn Screening Action Network to make this journey a little easier. My name is Lisa Brackville and I'm a wife, mother, and advocate. I partnered with Cure MLD to create the LDNBS Action Network four years after my daughter, Tori, passed away from Crabbe leukodystrophy. Tori's diagnosis and death inspired me to become involved in newborn screening advocacy in Pennsylvania, and I'm now continuing this work with the Leukodystrophy Newborn Screening Action Network. The LDNBS Action Network is a coalition of advocates dedicated to championing newborn screening for leukodystrophies and lysosomal storage disorders. We do not believe in wasting time and resources by starting from scratch with each new disorder. Instead, we want to build partnerships to advance the goal of newborn screening together. Our goal is to equip advocates with the research we've done and the resources we've developed. Our website has up-to-date newborn screening maps for ALD, CRAB A, and MLD, so you can quickly see which states are screening for which disorders. Clicking on a state yields useful information about how conditions are added. We've also created easy to follow steps to prepare you for advocacy. Knowing your disease, knowing your state, and knowing your story. We have a frequently asked questions page to help you navigate potential challenges. And most importantly, we have the ability to connect you with fellow advocates in your state to learn from past experiences. Advocacy can be a challenging, long, and emotional experience, especially for those of us who are parents of leukodystrophy children. That's why we're here, to make the work a little easier and the burden a little less heavy. We may not have all the answers quite yet, but we know where to find them and we know who to ask. We're ready to do the work. information and to get in touch, please visit ldnbs.org. So that gives you a really brief overview of what we're trying to do at LDNBS, but I did want to show you the updated map because that video was made a few months ago and now you can see that Georgia and Pennsylvania are screening for Crabbe. I also want to show you my wonderful spreadsheet. I am such a data geek and I love this spreadsheet. I, this is the result of, I don't know, a hundred hours of research looking into each state's newborn screening program because that gives us a better idea of which states to prioritize, which ones are worth pursuing because some like California, there really is no advocacy allowed, so to speak, because they only screen for what's on the federal recommended uniform screening panel. I also included on the far right side, which lab handles the newborn screening for the state. So you'll see Perkin Elmer on there, because one of the things that I discovered is that many states use a different state's lab. Like Iowa handles the screening for not only Iowa, but North and South Dakota and Alaska. So if Iowa isn't screening for a condition, then there's really no point in trying to get it in the other three. So our job or my goal has always been to add, to equip advocates with all these resources because it makes the journey a little easier. So I just wanted to close with a few more pictures of my precious baby. And um, I'm so grateful that you took the time to listen to my story and our advocacy. And I also wanted to thank you for all the work that you do 
because without you, newborn screening wouldn't be possible. So thank you for all that you do to save the lives of babies. And I hope you have a great day.